And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. We're doing our special on the holy face of Jesus. And today we're here with a very special guest, Father Lawrence Carney. Father, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, let's take it from the top. Uh, talk a little bit about your journey and how you came to love and, uh, and take on the devotion to the holy face of Jesus. Okay, let's start the prayer. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, yes. I became the chaplain of the Benedictines of Mary about almost eight years ago. And I asked one of the sisters. I was going to write a uh, newsletter. What should I write about? And she said, write about the holy face. So I started researching that. And then simultaneously, within a week, someone sent me a book called The Holy Man of Tours, which is, uh, the, this is the book I got. And I was reading it, and I, I was just amazed that there were so many interesting things in the life and I found out that the holy face that he became an apostle of was the holy face uh, that was in tours. And Sister Mary St. Peter, who received the messages, found a golden arrow. She was drawn to tours by uh, praying in front of a relative of St. Martin. And Verbal Leo de Pont was born in Martinique in the Caribbean. And when his wife was dying, very young, she wanted their daughter to go to the Ursulines to be taught in tours. So they got together and that's where the communications were happening. And that's where the image behind me, uh, one that's a copy uh, in tours, uh, there was over 6,000 certified miracles there. And so the three patrons of the Holy Face are St. Michael, St. Louis, the King of France, and St. Martin of Tours. So St. Martin of Tours is November 11th, and that's my birthday, November 11th. So I thought, wow, okay, this is starting to really make a lot of sense. And we just went from there. So now I'm excited about this devotion. So which three saints? St. Saint Michael, the Archangel. Okay. St. Louis the Ninth, King of France, okay. and St. Martin. Excellent, excellent. And yet, speak a little bit about the connection with St. Martin of Tours, because I didn't realize he was, he was related to the Holy Face. Yeah, so Sister Mary St. Peter, who received the revelations in the 1840s about the Holy Face that's uh, behind the arch confraternity of the Holy Face, she was with a very strict confessor who had a knack for not letting any women go to the convent unless they were going to go there for life. So she wanted to go to a convent that was close to Wren where she was living, but they didn't have any room. And she wanted to go to Orleon, but the confessor was just him and Han. So they had the relics of St. Martin in a chapel nearby, a chapel dedicated to St. Martin. And she passionately uh, re made reverence to these relics and consecrated her uh, religious life to St. Martin. So soon after that, there was an opening in tours and her confessor let her go there and she joined. And when she went there, she felt at home. So that's how St. Martin brought her there. And there's other things. Um, and then Venerable Leo de Pont, he was drawn to tours because that's where you know, his wife wanted her daughter to be taught, the Ursulines. So St. Martin is a thaumaturgist, which is a miracle worker. So he has a knack for making divine connections and these connections of these two people coming together is very important for this devotion to have its historical roots that we know it as now. So. 
Oh, excellent. And then it, aren't there, there are several miracles associated with this devotion with Mary of St. Peter, right? Yes, there's about at least 6,000. The Dublin Review reported that in the 1800s. They actually had someone go and look at the certificates that were written by medical professionals to show that there was over 6,000 miracles. So they were done in Venerable Leo de Pont's drawing room. And he would have this image that I have right here, one like it, it was touched to the Bella Veronica in Rome, like this one. And he had a perpetual flame burning in front of it with olive oil. So that's why this one has olive oil burning in it. So right now I use this kind of olive oil. So it's burning in there and he would take the olive oil out of it burning in front of the image and he would touch people with it and have a certain prayer over them. And sometimes they didn't get healed immediately. So there was one instance where he prayed three times and the lady wasn't healed. And he said, let's do it again. Get on your knees. And a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, a seventh time, a seventh, eighth time. And finally, the ninth time, this woman was healed, completely healed. And one time, a young lady said, if it's your will, God, please heal me from this element. And Venerable Leo Pont was praying his bravery. So that's not how you pray. You have to pray with confidence. So she didn't do that. She left and he came back an hour later and, and said, you're right, I need to pray with confidence. So she said, God, heal me, like Venerable Leo Pont told her to do. And then she was healed on the spot and she went away fully recovered from her illness. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. I often wonder about that, Father, because we hear don't, uh, of course, we have to ask with confidence, but at the same time, we know it's not always God's will to Heal, to, to heal us. I mean, of course, he would, he would love for us to be in perfect health, but that might not be his, the, the will while we're on earth. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because yes. He said, he said that, um, that you were supposed to pray with that confidence. Maybe she just didn't have the confidence. Is that it? That was it for her. Each situation is different because uh, St. Apostle Gori, in a short work called God's Will and Tan puts it out and page 19 talks about maybe if I had health or wealth or honors, I would go to hell. So sometimes God does not want us to be healed, but he wanted 6,000 people to be healed in this drawing room so that we could look back a hundred and whatever years later and say, wait a minute, uh, what's, what's with this devotion? Why don't we know any, why don't we know much about it? So God's ways are very deep. So Venerable Leo de Pont himself had rheumatoid arthritis, and he was never healed of that. Yet he was the one that was an instrument used by God to heal over 6,000 people. So God's ways are deep. Makes sense. It would just seem like then he would say that, well, just ask, ask with greater confidence, or no, he understood that that just wasn't God's will. Is that how? Well, he was a... Tomatargist, so he had special virtues and gifts from God to be used as an instrument for God's plans. Yep. And so, blessed Pope Pius IX called him one of the greatest workers of all times, wonder workers of all time. So, saints have specific channels to God that some of us are not privy to, you know? <laughs> yep. That makes sense. That's what, I, that's what I was thinking. And now a question about the olive oil. I'm assuming the olive oil was always blessed that he had in the candle. I'm sure. I haven't read. Uh, maybe I have read, but I forgot. But I would assume that it was blessed because there's a blessing in the Roman ritual that's got an exorcism and a blessing. And I always bless my olive oil before I start burning it. Right. That's what I was, that, that was going to be my point. That in the old rite, there was always an exorcism. That was the blessing. The blessing had an exorcism. And nowadays we don't have that exorcism, which would seem to limit the potency of the graces given. That's right. So as many people know, I'll just say for the people listening that don't, when the priest prays those prayers at the Roman ritual, he has a stole that has a purple and a white side. So when you do the exorcism, the priest has the purple showing, and then when he does the blessing, he flips it over to the white. So 
we we start to show our spiritual weapons when we start to take out the old traditions right right and and speak about the connection like you said before something about the traditional latin mass and its link with the holy face devotion specifically how it deals with reparations is that right yeah so i've discovered that a lot of people who have devotion to the holy face happen to be very partial to the traditional latin mass and there's pious associations of the faithful that are promoting people to enroll and become acquainted with the revelations and the arch confraternity of the holy face and so i have been asked by uh, a certain prelate to start a movement on, in my priesthood and so we've started a pious association of the faithful called the league of saint martin and we promote uh, enrollment into the arch confraternity of the holy face and enrollment into the confraternity of the holy rosary and we also have as our three aims to make reparation number two is for reverence and number three is for reversion and conversion so the second one is for reverence so one of our goals in that reverence is to promote and spread the Latin Mass by our spiritual prayers. And then if we can do things practically and, and take action, the second leg of that is to promote the Latin Mass and its spread. Because the Latin Mass is so reverent. And one of the things we need to make reparation for is for irreverence in the sanctuaries of God. And so instead of going around and, and making check marks of all the places that aren't reverent, we're just gonna have spiritual combat here and start praying for that to happen. And hopefully that'll change the hearts of people that are being in a irreverent in the churches. Like when I was a pastor over 10 years ago, one of the most difficult things to do was to encourage people to be quiet in front of the most holy sacrament of the altar. And I was just banging my head on the wall, trying to get it to, to happen. So. I've just decided to come to the Latin Mass where it's easier. People really want to be reverent. And that's just one example of many to be quiet in a church. There's so many more examples. That makes sense. And I read something from Father Ripperger, the, the exorcist priest, where he, he speaks about uh, there being greater extrinsic merit, not in, intrinsic, every Mass is infinite value, but extrinsically based on our dispositions, the beauty, um, the dispositions of the, the priest as a private person, as well as the liturgy he's, he's uh, celebrating, that that's going to have an impact on the graces as they're applied by God to us, so the extrinsic merit. I read that also in Ludwig Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. So it's just the greater potency, the greater the spiritual effectiveness. Yeah, it's, it's extremely beautiful. I've read those quotes, and I love them, that uh, Father Ripperker uh, wrote, I can't uh, footnote them at, right now. I used to have them in my mind, but I'll say this. Uh, I've got, I've got, I'm experiencing a few illnesses and I work here and I do solemn high masses a lot of times. Priests come to visit and deacons and subdeacons, newly ordained priests, and the, they asked me to help as deacon and subdeacon. And I didn't learn that in a seminary, but I had to learn it later on. And Boy, it's it's hard. It is hard to be a deacon. It's because you got to know where to stand. You got to know how to take off the paw. You got to know when to genuflect when you leave the altar, and it it's a sacrifice. But you know what? That sacrifice and trying to be reverent and trying to learn these rites, it's going to open up the the dam for the graces to flow. Because I mean, I'm trying to to be more reverent to God, so. It's just an external thing. If you do that, it's just like if you pray a rosary with reverence and you take 30 minutes instead of five minutes, most likely there's going to be more spiritual benefit from it. Right. So. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. What would you say some of the best practices are? I don't know if best practices is the word for it, but some of the major elements of the Holy Face devotion. In other words, with the Divine Mercy devotion, they use the term finch. F-I-N-C-H, where the feast, the image, the novena, the chaplet, and the hour. I would love to make an acronym one day about the Holy Face devotion, like the feast, Shrove Tuesday, uh, the medal, right? That would be one of them. 
the golden arrow prayer. What, what would be some of some things like that that maybe you would add to that? Well, there's one thing I'm developing that a, a priest friend of mine told me. And in the old missal, there's a section, and this is really for priests. There's a section that has masses for specific uh, elements. Like there's a mass for the crown of thorns. There's a mass for the cross. There's a mass for the five wounds of Jesus. There's a mass for the nails and the lance. There's a mass of the sudarium or the, the shroud that was, he was buried in. And there's a few more that deal with the passion. And these masses, I think we need to start utilizing them because Jesus said to Sister Mary St. Peter, I want you to take the weapons that were used to crucify me and to hurl them at my enemies so that they, you know, have a conversion or get removed. And, and I think that we really need to develop an acronym maybe for, for this. So it's sort of like saying, hey, guys, there's, a, there's some buildings over there. And we've got some, we've got some tanks and some airplanes and some jets and some stealth bombers. We haven't used them for like 80 years. Let's get them out. Let's start learning how to use them again and let's then go and hit the enemy with this so i think that's what what we're looking at is we need to popularize uh the section i'm going to write in this book that i'm writing on the holy face about how we as priests we're the most powerful people in the world how we can start utilizing the spiritual power that god has given us through our inheritance which is the, the holy latin rite the cal of the catholic church Absolutely. I, th I think the image, obviously, that's also an important, I mean, I think of the Shroud right. of Turin, but also the image that you have that you have behind you and having the candle burning with the olive oil. I mean, I, maybe that would be one of the best practices for honoring and devotion to the Holy Face. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of people that want to do something, but they don't know quite what to do. And I think this devotion is so rich in treasures that it's like finding a a treasure chest underground and, and digging it up and starting to open it up. And I think that so many priests, religious, and especially lay people, they can actually do something with this devotion and, and make it so that it can be popularized so other people can understand it. And it needs to be quote unquote marketed. But I think there's definitely a cult that is starting to grow around these messages because this the messages are a blueprint to get us out from underneath the oligarchs and the communists and the revolutionary men that want to, to enslave us. And Venerable Leo de Pont, he saw the communist manifesto that came out when he was living. And he said, if the communists have their way, they're going to enslave the whole world someday. I think he's a prophet. I hope it doesn't be, I hope it's not fulfilled in that way, though. Right. Right, and it just seems like all the messages that we're getting private revelation, whether it's the Holy Face or Fatima, it's reparations and protection against communism. Would you say that's the main connection with the Holy Face and Fatima, or is there anything, I mean, reparations and-, and Yeah, yeah, in my book, I've, I've connected uh, the messages of, uh, the, of Sister Mary St. Peter, in the Holy Face to Fatima and also Trey Fontaine, which happened in the 1940s in Rome. And they're connected with uh, reparation, but also to pray like an archer, to pray uh, like the golden arrow, to pray to pierce the heart of God is, is a way to open that up. So, yeah, I think uh, reparation is a huge thing. In this, because we need to repair the relationship that we as a human family have with God. And I think what's hard for, for me, maybe other people, is that we start to individualize our relationship with, with God and society. But I'm starting to realize when I get deeper and deeper into the, the rights of the, the Latin rite, how we have to live as a society. I mean, it's not just a priest at the altar, it's a deacon, it's a subdeacon, and then it's the minor orders, and then 
you know, a bunch, I have a bunch of nuns here that, that chant and they participate in their state of life. And then the lay people come and how we have to support our bishops and encourage them to, uh, to fight for reparation and to fight for uh, reverence in our sanctuaries, because I still need to find this quote. I, I'm going to call a priest that I think knows where to find it, but what we do in the sanctuary determines what happens in the world. So that's why reverence is so important. And we can't ask God to help us if we don't have the right relationship between God and our human family. So that's why in the book I'm writing that I'm, I'm hoping to get about a million people signed up for the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face. So hopefully it'll have that impact because right now we're at a point where I don't, a lot of priests are coming and talking to me and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I think that God has a preordained amount of people that are in the state of grace that are making reparation to repair all the evil things that are happening with how people are treating God. There's a certain amount of people that need to rise up and make reparation in the state of grace and that when they rise up at, to a certain level, then the title will, will swing and those people that are evil, they'll be delivered into the hands of the good people. And what's interesting, if you look in the Old Testament, it doesn't take a whole lot of good people to conquer a whole bunch of evil people. But right now, there's just too many evil people and not enough good people. So I think this devotion, um, which I, I think it should be underneath the protection of Our Lady, if it's ever going to take off the ground from where it is now, that she needs to be the one that is our leader and our role model. But I think if she leads the way, that more people will want to become in the state of grace and follow this devotion. And then we'll start to see that God will deliver the enemy into our hands. And in this devotion, Jesus told Sister Mary St. Peter, he doesn't want the death of the sinner, but their conversion. Right. So that's the beauty of it, the charity of it all. Right. And would you think that there would be any specific title of Our Lady? That, that we would pray to her under for the protection of the spreading of the devotion to the Holy Face? I don't know if there was anything that read yeah, that, That's a very good question. I'm reading in uh, the original source of the biography of Sister Mary St. Peter that she thinks, maybe it's from the Revelations too, that Our Lady under the title of the Holy Name of God is, is something... I'll have to look it up someday to get that out. And by the way, that reminds me um, that when St. Therese of Lisieux entered Carmel, her sister, her blood sister, gave her a total biography from uh, Father Han Vier on the life of Sister Mary St. Peter that has these revelations. And St. Therese of Lisieux based a lot of her spirituality on her biography. And Sister Mary St. Peter hasn't been canonized yet. Yet, St. Therese of Lisieux based a lot of her holiness on this biography. So that's a secret that we need to get out. And that's what I'm going to get out in the book that I'm writing. Absolutely. That connection between the, the holy name and the holy face. And that also starts bringing together multiple orders, right? Because now you have the Dominicans, the Carmelites, and the Benedictines. Aren't there connections between... I mean, of course, they, you know, they all honor the holy name and the holy face, but isn't there a special link with each of those or one of those? Yes, it's because King David wrote the Psalms, and I think every other Psalm talks about the holy name of God, and blessed be the holy name of God, etc. And even Jesus Christ taught us about the holy name in the Our Father, you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, the Dominicans, the Benedictines, the Franciscans, all religious orders are defending the name of God just because the Psalms have it. And then it's all over the Holy Scriptures. So St. Bernard, uh, it, this was revealed to Sister Mary St. Peter, St. Bernard was given the charge to defend the Holy Land. And he started a crusade and people surrounded themselves to go to the holy land because of his preaching of the holy name of the holy land well we need crusaders to 
defend the holy name of God now, which is even more important than this temporal place that won't exist in, in eternity, whereas the name of God has existed from eternity and will exist until the forever. Absolutely. And I think that's what people do when they go to heaven, the angels, is, is they adore his holy name. Absolutely. And it makes sense. If we say someone's name, generally the first thing that pops into our head is their face. So, yes. so we, we say someone's name, their face pops into our head. So that'd be the connection there. And then there's, I'm actually, I actually live about 20 minutes from the Holy Face Monastery in Clifton, New Jersey, right? By oh, the yeah. Yeah. And one of the Benedictine, uh, the abbot there, he was actually saying he wrote a book on the Holy, on the Shroud of Turin. And he said that anytime you speak about the Holy, the Holy name or the Holy Face, you have to speak about the Eucharist because that's on the back of the Holy Face medal as well as it's getting all the power from the Eucharist. So he, he was just making that connection. I know it's all tied in together, but I guess he wanted to really hone in on the connection to the Eucharist. Is it the monastery, the Holy Face of Jesus in Clifton, New Jersey? That's it. That's 20 minutes away. Here's a picture of it right here. There we go. And it was uh, Padica. His name is um, Stefano, Father Stefano Padica. He wrote this book on the Holy Face. It's a great source for the devotion to the Holy Face. So I don't know if, if the abbot knows him or not. Well, but the, he wrote this book in uh, 1960, 1959. And it was originally published in 1960. So it's a gem of a book. Excellent. The... the founder of the Holy Face Monastery was actually the spiritual director of Blessed Maria Pierina. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there's a, there's a big connection there. That's right. Yeah, she, she definitely had something to do with the Holy Face. Uh, her, her devotion to the Holy Face isn't connected to the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face, so I'm, I'm pointing that out in my book so that people can see uh, the distinctions, because it's important to get our distinctions, because people like Father Ripperger and, and theologians, they talk about St. Thomas and how it's important to know distinctions. So I'm just doing a rough try to getting the distinctions of some of the apostles of the Holy Face so that we can hone in and, and learn how to be the best um, adorers of the Holy Face of Jesus. Right, right. And of course, all the images of the Holy Face of Jesus are powerful, but specifically the one that you have behind you for, for multiple reasons. Why would that be, if you want to call it the, the best image or the, the one that would be, the, you know, the best, I suppose you could say the best one for us to use in our devotion to our Lord? Yes. Well, yeah, that's a great question because there's three major objects of the Holy Face of Jesus that Jesus has left us. So the first one would be the Vela Veronica, which is a sixth station of the cross. And that is the object of his passion. And then we have the Shroud of Turin that has his face. And that would be the object of his death. And then we have the Vela of Monopello that's becoming very popular. And that would be the veil that indicates his resurrection. So each of these has different facets to it. And the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face is focusing on the object of the passion, the face of the passion of Jesus Christ. And that's why this devotion based upon the passion is so important for our times because we know the church is going through a passion right now. And so this devotion is for our times. And uh, Jesus Christ revealed to Sister Mary St. Peter that my father is very disappointed because so many people are blaspheming God. And he said to her that my father's not gonna use the elements to punish the race. He's gonna use revolutionary men to punish the race, the human race. So he's the one giving us the punishment. We've seen it now, it's these revolutionary men, infiltrators in the church, communists. So if he's the one giving us the punishment, he's also the one who can tell us how to get out of it. And so that's why this devotion is going to be, I think, in the future, so popular and powerful. So we're just at the very beginning of, what, of uh, the foot of that mountain 
and we're looking up at this devotion, it's going to be huge because Sister Mary St. Peter was told by Jesus Christ, this is probably going to be one of the greatest devotions that heaven will ever give to the earth. So I used to be in investments and I had to look at companies that were like going to be rising up fast. I even used to collect baseball cards when they were worth something. And you try to get rookie cards and you try to predict, well, this player is going to be good before he's good because then when he gets good, it's worth more because it would go up. So this devotion is sort of like my, my past where I see there are so many marks to show that this devotion is going to have a big impact on the whole world. It's the Absolutely. face of Jesus. So how can we not expect it to? But it's, it's not just the face of Jesus, but it's, it's a whole cult of, of how the face of Jesus can help us. And Jesus Christ has told this, this great Carmelite nun how we can be devoted to this and how we can get ourselves out of this mess that we're in with the, the, uh, the lockdowns and all that stuff and the face masks. Because this devotion's object is the uncovered image of God. Whereas the enemy wants to cover the image of God, which humans are made in the image of God. They want to cover our face. So, right, right. Oh, I see great things for this devotion also. And, and is there anything about the image behind you or any of the other, the other two images, maybe something about the, the, the image itself that maybe we wouldn't know at face value or something that, that, that we should be drawing more attention to that we're not paying attention to? Anything that you could think of? Yeah, let me pull it off my wall here so there's that's the engraving there was a miracle i'll talk about in just a minute but i want to show the back of this this is a third class relic and it's got a wax seal from a cardinal and this one was produced during the reign of pope leo the 13th So what happened is blessed uh, Pius IX was exiled or he exiled himself because there were people that were threatening uh, the Vatican. So he got out, but he, he asked all the churches in Rome to make uh, devotions. And at St. Peter's Basilica, they took the Val Veronica out for public display. and for three days, and the third day, a miracle happened. Now, the Val Veronica is very undistinguishable. It's very darkened, it's, it's very hard to see the face. So they put a silk veil over it. And what happened is that silk veil started to have the bold outlines of his face, and then there was a death-like hue, a light that came from it. And the, the cannons and the, uh, of the church were moving around seeing because they saw this very beautiful miracle and then they rang the bells and so many people thronged to it and the notary of the vatican said this is definitely a miracle and it got into the day book of the vatican so there's proof that this was a very beautiful miracle it happened for three hours and it really showed something so immediately artists began to write you know draw this face and they started to engrave it and print it on linen and silk and send it all over Europe. And one of them got into the hands of Little Pont, and that's where the 6,000 miracles happened. So that's a very beautiful thing that happened in Rome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And where can people go, any of the listeners or anyone who watches this, whether now or five years from now, where can they go to find that, that image you have behind you or a replica of it, rather? That's a good question because. In my research, they started producing these in the 1850s. And there was a group of priests that would do that and then some other people until about the time of World War II. So now no one does it anymore. So the League of St. Martin has reproduced 200 of them. And I'm in contact with a bishop in Rome to get started with the process where I can go there or I'll send them to a friend of mine, a priest there, who will get 200 of these touched to the Val Veronica and we're going to get official 
papers with, with wax seals like this one has. And then I'm just gonna send them out to certain people the first year, my hope, send them out to certain monasteries and convents, to send them out to captains of the League of St. Martin and other people uh, like certain schools, like there's a school that's called St. Martin. And I'm just gonna send them out because I'm not gonna sell them. You can't sell these things. I'm just give them to people so that the uh, idea of this devotion spreads. And I'll give them instructions how to frame it, how to get a, a candle burning or a uh, oil lamp burning so that the, a light can be burning in front of because it's a third class relic of Jesus Christ. It's been touched to his face that was touched by the, the veil that Veronica wore. So right now we don't have any, but we could have 200. And we're praying because there's so many obstacles with the Holy Face. Any you and your viewers, if you get involved with the Holy Face, be prepared to suffer. Be prepared to fight with the demons of delay. They are very vicious. They 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 stop us everywhere they can, and they just try to chug up the machine. And we just got to keep praying through that. And things take a lot longer than they should take. But that's just part of the deal. It's just what we have to deal with. Makes makes sense. And and there's no other unofficial maybe like a picture we could pull up, print it out on our computer. That would be similar if there was something we were going to Google. We have a replica of it and then print it out, hang it up. There's uh, some artists and some businesses that are starting to reproduce these, but I don't have uh, links to those at the tip of my fingers right now. But I think it'd be pretty easy to find it if you did a little internet search. Okay. And even if we had any picture of the holy face of Jesus, it would be good practice you'd recommend to have the votive candle next to it with the olive oil? Yeah, that's what I tell people until they start to get these is you might as well start. You can have a priest bless it. There's a blessing of images in the Roma Ritualli, and then you can have a candle starting to burn. That's what a lot of the members of the League of St. Martin are doing right now because we don't have these available yet. Right, right. Is there is there anything else that we should cover that we didn't? I'm sure a lot of things that we should <laughs> cover. <laughs> we could probably go on all day, but any other main points that you would think to get across to people uh, that we didn't hit on? Well, I'll say I'll say this as like a concluding point is I don't know about you, but sometimes I see how the world is going and how these elites are trying to tell us what to do. They're they're have they think they have this authority from who knows where to tell us that we can't travel, to tell us that we can't go into a church to pray. They're telling us that there's this virus and that it's morphing. It's this invisible uh, danger that it hasn't been proven. They're getting this because they have power from the devil. And I think that God is trying to tell us, if you all don't start to have confidence in me, I'm going to let them do what they want. And that's, that's a horrible punishment. But I think that if we get real serious about devotion to the holy face, this is definitely one way that we can start to take out the, the spiritual fire weapons to attack this enemy. Because sometimes people come to me and I myself, like, what can we do? I feel helpless. Because I, I cannot become the governor of Missouri and make a difference. You know, it's it's like, Politics is too late. So we have to get into missile combat. And, and I think that we also need to be positive that there's a lot of silver lining with the evil that's happened in the last year. And if evil gets worse, I think that the goodness can also get uh, like squared even better. So I think that people really need to take to heart to research this devotion and become a part of it so that we can have a, a, a spiritual army underneath the face of Jesus Christ, his beautiful banner, which his sacred heart worships his face, because his face is the sign of divinity and his heart is his, signifies his humanity. And underneath the banner of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the holy name of God as, as our general, that we can have this movement of spiritual troops to start making some spiritual ground and to take down some of these elites and show them who who is god 
And that's what St. Michael the Archangel did. He says, who was like in the God when, when Lucifer was trying to start his own kingdom, which he got, it's, it's hell. And we need to, to find out who's going to go to heaven, who's going to go to hell. Because Our Lady of Fatima said, people are falling into hell like snowflakes, and I don't want anyone to go there. And she doesn't want anyone to go there. She doesn't even want anyone to go to purgatory. So I think we need to get surrounded around the banner of the holy face of Jesus and see what God has in mind. Absolutely, Father. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's so important, especially the time we live in, but really in any period of time in history, we, we need to seek God's face and to just be with him always as, as best as we can now so we could be with him forever in heaven. And if, um, if you could give us any contact, not contact information, but website, where can we go to find more of your, your information? And then if you could close us down with the blessing, please. Sure. So the League of St. Martin, our Pi Association is found on www.martinians.org or if you type in saint martin excuse me league of saint martin you'll find us and there we have a uh, just a whole bunch of information we have an email for information if you want to know more and we'll we answer all those emails so that's how you can find out about our pious association of the faithful now i'll give you all a blessing Benedictio de mi potentis, patris et fili, spiritus on shinit super vos et mani et semper. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. God bless you and your work. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a great night. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.